Well, it wasn't in the budget three weeks ago, but out of the blue, federal money has now been allocated to tackle eating disorders. $70 million has been announced by Health Minister Mark Butler with a heavy emphasis on research and education. The decision had sort of been hinted at by Mark Butler in question time last week. Independent MP Zoe Daniel had asked that question and has been committed to the cause of finding more resources for eating disorders since she entered the Parliament. We spoke to her from Melbourne before her return to the nation's capital. Zoe Daniel, good to have you back on the program. You asked a question in the House last week regarding the tragic death of a 15-year-old girl from an eating disorder. You asked about why there was no funding for services in the budget. The government has come good since then, though. Is it adequate what's been announced today by Mark Butler? Look, it's good news. It's just a start, and there are lots of pieces to this. My question last week really went to treatment pathways. A lot of the funding that's been announced today is to do with prevention, education and research. That absolutely has to happen as well. But the problem is that we've got a lot of people who are already on the edge of the cliff or indeed over the cliff. So they won't be helped necessarily by prevention, education and research at this stage. So all of those pieces need to be funded. But I really do, I want to say clearly, appreciate the genuine listening that the government has done uh, to me on behalf of community about this. This is a deep crisis. And the fact that the government has come up with a substantial um, block of funding today is really good news. I know what you say about research. That's a longer term investment, I guess. Uh, education of GPs, though, is being highlighted as a priority area in today's $70 million funding bucket, if you like. What's that going to achieve or why is that uh, being funded, do you believe? Yeah, that really is a big missing piece, and I'm really pleased to see that in there. It is something that I've talked a lot to the Health Minister and also Emma McBride, who deals with mental health, about. GPs are the front door, usually, for people with an eating disorder, and eating disorders are incredibly complex mental and physical disorders. GPs often aren't equipped to deal with those, they perhaps don't have adequate training, maybe they don't want to deal with it because it really is very challenging and GPs have a lot on their plate. And then GPs also find it difficult to find the treatment pathways for people because there aren't enough psychologists, for example, and, and dietitians and others. So I do think it actually is critical to provide some support to GPs, particularly those that are interested in the space. And the other thing about it, Greg, is from a, a consumer or patient perspective, I've advocated for a sort of a, a database so that when someone is looking for a doctor for usually their child that has an eating disorder, they can find someone near them who has expertise and interest in it. So I think that's part of the picture as well. All right. Well, let's go to treatment services. Again, referring to Mark Butler, in his answer to you last week, in fact, he said, we, federally, are trying to do more. And he noted up to 40 uh, psych cons consultations, 20 dietitian consultation services established, I think, by the previous government. Do you have a clear view or a clear picture in your own mind about what additional needs to be done on services? I think it's to do with the fragmentation of services and also it's all fine and well to say well you've got X number of psychology appointments but if you can't get access to a psychologist or you have to wait three months for that appointment when you have a developing eating disorder that's a real problem. The other issue is trying to keep people out of hospital because people get to the critical end of this and they end up in the revolving door of hospital admissions where they go into hospital they're forcibly refed they're sent home, they still can't eat, they end up back in hospital. I have young people in my electorate who've had 30 plus admissions over the last 18 months to two years and these are children as young as 11. So at home support's really key. That's something that I've been talking to the government about that is mentioned in today's announcement as, a, as an area of interest. Um, but I think it's really important not only for 
the person with the eating disorder, but also for their family, that some at-home support is provided. Because what often happens is parents end up with their own mental illness, depression, uh, financial problems, other siblings end up with mental illness and families collapse uh, because of the eating disorder. So it needs to be holistic. So a little more reflectively, Zoe Daniel, as you've just referred to there, you've obviously uh, come personally into contact with many who have suffered eating disorders. What's your own reflection, though, on why this caseload is growing? Do you believe it to be related to the pandemic or, or post-pandemic uh, outcomes on health? Well, I think there's a portion of people with eating disorders who may have a, a genetic predisposition. That's part of the research that we need to do. I do think, though, that isolation during the pandemic and particularly that coupled with social media has triggered an increase in eating disorders. And I think that needs to be part of the research piece as well. Um, the, the triggers can be different uh, for, for different people. And as I said, Greg, you know, I've got families in my electorate with children as young as 10 or 11 who are anorexic and are really uh, at risk of death uh, from this. And it is the most deadly of all mental illnesses. And as you saw in, in the question that I asked in the chamber last week, the, there was a young girl, a 15-year-old Olivia, who lost her life as a result of her eating disorder. And that was largely as a result of the sense of hopelessness that she felt about the treatment and support that was available to her in a sense that she couldn't escape the disorder. And, and I'm, again, I'm really pleased to see the government listening and stepping into the space. Yeah, no, terrible situation. And let's hope that the uh, rapid rising case numbers uh, eventually does flatten out before too long. Just finally, Zoe Daniel, you'll so soon be making your way to Canberra for more parliamentary sittings. Just on a news development today, nine partners at the consulting giant PwC have been, in effect, ordered to take leave. At face value, do any of the details surrounding this case look to you like something the National Anti-Corruption Commission might choose to take a look at? Uh, well, maybe. I mean, I, I'm pleased to see PwC uh, being accountable and, and taking some steps around it. it. It does appear that it could be something that's within the remit of, of the NAC uh, once it's, it's properly stood up. I think that's a watching brief. Uh, but I would say Greg, that this raises all sorts of further questions around government use of consultants. Uh, we've seen that increasingly happen in recent years at huge cost to taxpayers. And I guess it, it creates a set of questions around what kind of advice is being given and why. Uh, and it, is that for the benefit uh, of Australian taxpayers who are paying the cost of those consultants or not? We might take some of those up. In fact, I think they have been asked, both the Treasurer and the Finance Minister, but we might uh, seek some more answers on that. Zoe, Daniel, thanks again for joining us. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Greg.